90.7 FM, listener-sponsored, KPFK, Los Angeles. Welcome to the Animal Agenda. I'm Tom Keish, and our guest this week is Kieran Doherty, CVA, Director of the Volunteer Program at the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association, otherwise known as GLAZA. Hello, Kieran. Hello. So let me pause to disclose that I'm speaking and asking questions as an individual in my own individual capacity, and that for several years ago, I volunteered for GLAZA, probably more than a dozen actually, which is where I first met Kieran. At the LA Zoo, I mostly volunteered in the enrichment department, which was more than enjoyable, and I helped and sometimes even designed, make puzzles and feeder toys for different species of animals. Okay, Kieran, before we're off to the races, did I get anything wrong so far? That all sounded perfect. Oh, my goodness. That's a first, I think. All right. Let me read a few things from the LAZoo.org website. The Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association, CLAZA, was created in 1963 as a private nonprofit fundraising organization to support the zoo. Today, CLAZA provides support through fundraising, membership, marketing, and public relations, organizing special events and travel programs, producing award-winning publications, coordinating one of the large largest zoos volunteer program in the country, administrating the contract for visitor service concessions within the zoo, and supporting community relations. The LA Zoo and Botanical Gardens opened in November 28th of 1966. The zoo receives nearly 1.8 million visitors a year and is owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles. The size is about 133 acres, and they are open nearly every day, except for Thanksgiving and Christmas. I think that wraps that part up got all that little fact stuff out so hello hello do you want to tell me since i mentioned it how many volunteers are in the system of glaza how many are active how many do 20 hours a week and about how many are near full time oh that's a really good question um we have about i'm gonna pull up a stat real quick um on my active volunteers we have about 421 about 421 active volunteers. Um, many of those volunteers come in on a weekly basis, and all, most of those volunteers have a commitment of at least 100 hours a year. So it's about eight hours a month that volunteers come in. Is that the minimum required, or what is the minimum? That's the minimum or minimum commitment is 100 hours a year for the Glaza volunteer programs. Perfect. Um, I volunteer at a number of different places. They all seem to have minimums. Why is there a minimum? Uh, we have minimums. There's a lot of training involved. So in order to understand completely and have all the, the right tools to succeed in, in these positions, there's a lot of training, whether it is uh, animal information, customer service, uh, operations, empathy, all of, all of the, all of the things. Um, there's a lot that goes into training to become a volunteer. And so that's a lot of investment. So if you're going to be here and go through all that training, um, it's nice to, to use that training as much as you can. And so an hour, a year, a year to two years, um, or a hundred hours is breaks down. To, it keeps you active in what you're doing in the zoo. So if you're still here, if you take a long period of time off, you kind of have to, regroup and figure out what has changed, what's going on. And so to keep that active and, and on a regular basis is super helpful. So you understand what's going on at the zoo and how, do, how can I be most helpful to the zoo and um, to my, my department? Two things. One, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've been, I haven't been there in 12 years and I know there's a lot of things that are different. So we're going to talk about some of that. And the second, if I remember correctly, like for the zoo, I think I had to get fingerprinted and tuberculosis tested and go through a interviews and things like that. So there is a lot that goes into it. There is. So the the application and onboarding process is pretty intense because you're going to be working with children. You're going to be working with the public. Some uh, volunteers work behind the scenes with animal care. So there is a, a background check. So we need to ensure by city law, there is a anybody working with children or the elderly have to have a background check. Um, so all the staff and volunteers have uh uh, complete that process. Also, because we're working with children and uh, animals, there's a TB test. Everybody has to do a TB test every year. So just so we don't scare away half the listeners, <laughs> if you volunteer at the zoo, you don't have to volunteer around children or the elderly. There's different programs that deal with different aspects, but the Correct. city just wants to make sure you're safe. Yes, yes. 
um, and because you're working with the public and just to, for your safety and everybody around you as well. So makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. How long have you been with Glaza? I have, I started as a volunteer in 2001 and I became staff in 2004. So um, art school math tells me that's about 20 years <laughs> of staff. And uh, how did you get involved in the field other than starting as a volunteer? Did you know you wanted to do this? That's also a really great question because there isn't really a, a field. There isn't a, a, well, there's a field, but there isn't a, a degree. I don't, I don't know how many people, how many kids think when I grow up, I want to be a volunteer administrator because that sounds riveting. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an animator and a paleontologist. And I ended up going to school and got my Bachelor of Fine, Fine Arts degree in animation. I became an animator. I did all the things. And um, I was at the zoo one day with my portfolio in hand, and I was watching the animals, and I realized that I was more interested in what was happening in that habitat and what those animals were doing than what was going on in my portfolio. And that's when I realized this this is interesting. And there was a, a volunteer there, an observational research volunteer, doing some observations of some um, of our primates. And I asked her what she was doing. She said she was a research volunteer, and I went, oh, that's totally cool. I want to do this. And I've reached out to the coordinator, the volunteer coordinator, and um, I started in the research class, and then I became an enrichment volunteer, and then I became a docent, and then I became staff. And this is where I have found my true love. I really love being here. There's so much in that answer that I need to pull on. So first off, you have the initial CVA after your name now. What is that? CVA. So CVA stands for Certification and Volunteer Administration. So I recently acquired those credentials after completing um, a course and um, I passing the, the annual exam uh, or the, I think it's every five years I have to pass an exam uh, certifying that I understand the roles of volunteer administration, the advocacy for, for the uh, position and um, understanding what we do here and and why it's important and how to or how to adhere to the best practices of volunteer administration there's so much more to ask about now but i'm going to go back so what are the different ways people can volunteer at the zoo i mentioned enrichment you mentioned enrichment so does that still exist you mentioned docent you mentioned research volunteers so what are ways people can volunteer at the zoo so i was look at there are what did I say? 421 different volunteers at our institution. There are 421 different reasons to volunteer and 400 different ways to volunteer. So you can enter as um, a general volunteer. General volunteer helps out on grounds, um, helping with wayfinding as ambassadors. They help with our events. Um, they also help in our garden, our enrichment garden. We also have um, behind the scenes opportunities that you can advance to, to help with food prep to help with enrichment. And then we also have under the docent umbrella, we have the docent specialist and the docent uh, program. And the docent specialists focus on a specific field. I wanna learn just about primates, or I just wanna learn about uh, birds or hoofstock or carnivores. And so you can focus on those specialties and you can be out on grounds engaging with guests, talking about the animals, talking about the conservation programs that we're part of. Um, and engaging in that way. And then we have the full docent where they take a 19 week class in taxonomy, ecology and conservation. Um, and they can lead some of the school group tours, whether it's, um, uh, high school, college member tours, advancement tours, pickup tours, being out on grounds, um, engaging in that way and having those really great uh, opportunities. And then we have offsite opportunities as well. We have community engagement through, um, virtual field trips. So we have field trips just like we are right now through a Zoom. And then we also have um, special needs outreach where we take um, some artifacts and activities to facilities that can't get to the zoo. So maybe it might be a retirement home. It might be a school with special needs. And we'll go and take a little zoo to them um, with just artifacts and activities. And so we have those opportunities. We have enrichment if you want to help behind the scenes. Uh, uh, I love enrichment. It's very creative. It's finding, it's problem solving. How do I 
encourage natural behavior with these animals? Um, what kind of devices um, or features can I include in this in this habitat to encourage those behaviors? Um, research, it's um, observational research. It's a UCLA extension course in learning how to observe animal behaviors. And we have a lot of projects throughout the zoo that are either happening just at the zoo. It might be an animal introduction. It might be to a new habitat. It might be with between new animals. It might be a national study, seeing how does how do animals engage in, in certain activities or spaces in their habitat, or it might be a global study as well. So uh, participating in these huge studies and being a part of that is fascinating. Um, what other opportunities am I missing? We have, those are all the Glaza volunteer opportunities. There's a lot more and you can mix and match. You don't have to do all one. This is the Animal Agenda on KPFK. I'm Tom Keish, and we're chatting with Kieran Doherty, CVA Director of the Volunteer Program at the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association, Glaza. You mentioned a bunch of things, but what I didn't hear, and maybe I just missed it, was petting zoo. Does that exist anymore? So the petting zoo, or our contact yard, um, is currently closed. Uh, we do have some older animals in there. So um, just to make it uh, more comfortable for them, we have closed it for the, to the public. But we do have volunteers in that space to help maintain the space, to help with cleaning it up and providing uh, food and enrichment items. So I, I know that Glaza is separate from the city zoo, and you're not to talk about animals. Um, or or the care of animals. You're we're talking about more the volunteer things, but I know everybody wants to like hold the baby lions or the orangutans or whatever like that. That is not a volunteer position, correct? <laughs> correct. Yeah, we do get applications every once in a while saying I just want to pet the tiger or I want to hold a baby chimp. Um, and I have to remind everybody that these are wild animals. That petting a tiger comes with consequences. Yeah. So in enrichment, I was able to go backstage a lot and I was in the tiger exhibit at one point, I guess, putting food out for the tigers while the tigers were backstage and just being within feet of them was amazing. And their vocal power was impressive. Also, I was able to go backstage to the draft um, barn where they were out in the yard. I went back and we did something in the draft yard. And to see the scale of those animals and how big, where they feed from and being six foot five and looking up and it's another 15 feet above me where they're eating from was really impressive. So um, I found it fascinating and I did have odd relationships on the other side of a fence with animals that I always walked by Elsie the Anoa and uh, she always seemed to come where I was working if she could get wherever I was working so even though I didn't do a whole lot of animal relationship stuff, I kind of did in a way. So I know you're not supposed to talk about it, but I just wanted to say that there is some, not contact, but personalities that you do learn through the fence or what have you. Yeah, that's that's the the excitement of those working in uh, behind the scenes with food prep and enrichment is that you get that relationship with the keepers and being behind the scenes, you get a, a different perspective. Of what's going on? I, I loved it. My favorite thing was building something that had never been designed before for the river otters, and I had to pitch it. I had to talk to the zoo about it, uh, the keepers about it, and we tried it, and they were they played with it for like seventeen minutes, which was like a record. I was told. So there's a lot of oppor opportunity for creativity at the zoo, I found, and also teaching and, and learning. So you also do programs or events. Can you tell me about some of the events that are coming up maybe later in the summer or in the early fall? We have a lot of events. It's summer, so we, we're shifting a lot of our events to the evening. So you'll see a lot of um, summer um, Friday nights at the zoo. We'll have brew at the zoo. Um, finding my page with all of those events. Um, we've got Roaring Nights uh, coming up in July. We've got Twilight at the Zoo. We've got Friday nights, um, all Friday nights throughout August. Um, a Brew at the Zoo in August. Uh, 
Another you know Roaring Nights. That, They're you fine. know what that is? Brew at the Zoo? So Brew at the Zoo, Brew at the Zoo is a sip and stroll event. So we have a lot of uh, breweries come to the zoo and you have an opportunity to try different uh, flavors um, of breweries. Um, we have music, we have bands, we have food trucks. Um, it's a lot of fun. Another thing I learned while at the zoo is there's better days and better times to go to the zoo. Everybody thinks sort of like a nice sunny day is a perfect day to go to the zoo. But what I found was that sometimes early morning when it's cool and overcast, do you have any tips on that? It depends upon what experience you're looking for. If you're looking for a nice, simple stroll, a nice, quiet stroll, um, mornings are cooler, but we also have a lot of school groups and camps coming out in the morning and the afternoon is a little quieter, um, but it's also a little warmer as well. So there's that as well. So if you're looking for, if you've got uh, sensory sensitivity, uh, afternoons are a little bit easier because it's less crowded. Um, weekends are very crowded um, and weekday mornings, we have a lot of uh, school groups coming in, So, but it's also cooler and you might see a little bit more uh, animal activity. Um, cloudy days are the best. Um, it's cooler. Animals are a little bit more active on cloudier days and days with, uh, I think what people call weather. Um, so when raindrops fall from the sky, sometimes animals are a little bit more active. Um, also those are great photography days. Um, those cloudy days are best days for photography. Speaking of photography, if I remember correctly, there were opportunities for people to take pictures. If I remember correctly. We have had uh, a, an event called Photo Day in the past. Right now, it's on hiatus while we restructure a lot of our events. So that's one of the events that is on the list to, to look at in the future. One of my favorite events, and it was an enrichment thing, was Snow Day. Mm -hmm. Can you explain Snow Days at the zoo? We haven't had snow days in a while, but those were fun. We That was um, usually in the summer, we would um, get a hold of a snow machine and we would cover some habitats in, in snow. I remember a while ago, a long time ago, putting them in habitats and just watching some of the animals respond to snow, which unfamiliar snow in, in Los Angeles and how the animals responded. And some who you'd think would love snow, um, polar bear, um, did not. <laughs> And said, no, no, I'm from Southern California. I'm going to go inside for a minute. Um, but uh, a lot of them, it just watching their responses to it. It's a, a great enrichment item um, to see something new, something uh, interesting to navigate around and uh, find their food in and refreshing. <laughs> yeah, we built snowmen and then put treats inside the snowmen. Mm -hmm. Um, and also in the summer, we would fill buckets of water and then put treats in the bucket and have it freeze and then put that in the enclosure. Yes. Uh, a lot of um, meat sickles um, and blood sickles for some of the animals. Um, they're great. Ice is a great vehicle for treats, especially yeah. in the summer. Do you have any uh, favorite stories uh, about a volunteer and uh, the impact of that volunteer? or um, how it influenced the animals or how it influenced the volunteer themselves? I have lots of those stories. Um, as one of the, the mission, it's the unofficial mission of our, our department is um, providing a meaningful experience for the volunteer um, that supports the zoo and Clausa and finding a space, uh, providing a safe space for the zoo or for the volunteer um, and celebrating everybody's unique uh gifts and contributions. And so I'm usually focused on how the impact this experience has on the volunteer. So I have different layers and, and levels of um, impactful stories, like the everyday stories I'll have. Um, I get to live vicariously to the volunteers. First off, volunteers, working with the volunteers is very different than working with staff. Volunteers, A, they want to be here and they look forward to being here. And after a shift, they're usually very excited and happy and relieved and rejuvenated. Unlike a typical staff position where you kind of, Ugh, I have to go to work and then you're kind of drained at the end of it. It's the reverse for the volunteers. And I love, I love that experience. And I love that I get to live vicariously through them and those aha moments that they have out on grounds when they talk with a guest and they they learn something new and the guest has that little spark of learning something new and they're inspired 
Um, and those little sparks inspire action. And so they have that, that power to inspire action. And they come back and they, they tell these stories of working with the guests. Good news. You're listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. I'm Tom Keish, and I'm chatting with Kieran Doherty. She's the director of volunteer programs at Glaza, which is the LA Zoo. So I want to push back a little bit on what you just said. And maybe I've romanticized it over the years. But I always found that the not only were the keepers incredibly knowledgeable, but they were incredibly passionate. And what I thought was so different than volunteering at the shelter system is shelter systems were encouraged to clean up poop, were asked to clean up poop, 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 you know, there's a lot of poop. Where at the zoo, we were not allowed to touch poop. From And my understanding was because the keepers need to look at that and make sure for the health of the animals. And I know you can't really talk about that, but I can. And I was always impressed with that, that the care is so high and the level of commitment. And I was always impressed. And I always understood as a volunteer why there were some things I wasn't allowed to do and why there were some things I was allowed to do. So let's let's just continue with um, with the stories, because that's what's really interesting to me. So do you have a specific volunteer that comes to mind besides me, of course, because, you know, I know. <laughs> but do you have a specific volunteer that comes to mind about like one of those impactful moments? I have s- several and narrowing them down is difficult. But uh, one that comes to mind is uh, a general volunteer who started um, about 15, 18 years ago. Um, she was uh, 15 at the time. And she's on the spectrum and she came in with her mom and we interviewed her and she couldn't look me in the eye and she looked at the, at the, at the floor and her mom gave all the answers. Um, I loved all the answers that her mom was giving. You know, she grew up at the zoo. She loves the animals. She's a little nervous and she could speak right now. And my supervisor at the time said, good luck. And I went, okay, challenge accepted. And um, I talking with, with her and her mom found what she really loved and what she wanted to experience here. And we set her up in a space that she was going to enjoy. Um, And it happened to be the ranch. And over the course of years of being there, she um, started to be able to look people in the eye and have direct conversations and had, she had such a great ownership of the space and the knowledge of the space, the confidence that, that came through her. Um, showed through her ability to communicate with people, to uh, teach and mentor people. Um, she became kind of a, a, a leader in that space um, because of the confidence she had in knowing what was going on in this area, knowing her role there and what she needed to do. Um, she's now been there for half her life wow. <laughs> in the space. And she is a confident, strong, smart young woman. And I'm so impressed that the impact this space had on her. Um, being able to build the confidence and just being comfortable around these animals gave her the confidence to to learn the space. That's an excellent story, excellent example. And one thing that I thought of as you were saying that, when I went to interview with the zoo, I didn't know about enrichment. And you all pointed me in a direction where I might fit in better than other places. And I think that that might be important for people to know who are listening that you don't have to know exactly what you want to do right out of the gate. Can you elaborate on that? Because there are so many different opportunities and people come in with a set idea of what they want to do here. Like, well, the zoo, I guess all they do with the zoo is is they take care of animals or all they do is is give tours. And so they have that, they come in with blinders of that's all that's available and so having these information meetings and talking about all the different opportunities here and how you can participate and let's find your strength and let's find your interests and let's match that with an opportunity here. So sometimes it's different than what you think when you come in. Like, I guess all that I can do here is, is tour. I'm like, well, you can tour if that's what you want to do. Um, but what are your other interests? And we discover people are artists. We discover people are builders. We discover people are storytellers. Um, they have all these talents and, um, we have so many different ways people can, can explore those and, and share those. So it's, there are different ways you can engage and support the zoo and make it meaningful. 
You mentioned enrichment garden earlier. So can you just say what that is? Because I know what it is, but the audience might not. So we have a, a space up at the top of the zoo across from um, the play park called Bonnie's Edible Garden. Um, and it's named after a former enrichment volunteer, Bonnie Jew, who helped build that space. Um, and we plant plants there that are safe from the animals from from root to leaf, everything and that on that plant is safe for the animal. Um, so there's no nightshade in there. Um, we don't plant any tomatoes or anything like that because any element of that of that plant could be toxic. So everything is safe. We might plant something creatively, like we'll plant some corn and then we might plant sweet peas around it. And as it grows up, you, the corn and the sweet pea are this big chunk of leafy goodness. And we'll pull the whole thing out and we'll feed it out to the animals, especially those animals that love to forage and pick through things. Um, we will plant dandelions on purpose on purpose because there's some animals that love dandelions we might plant um bananas and we'll use those leaves and and wrap and cut them up and use them as wrappings for other food items so these are vehicles for it's it's aside from their typical diet it's it's snacks it's enrichment it's uh, foraging it's exploratory uh some of it is just scent driven um we have Society garlic, which is very odiferous. So if people want to know more about how to volunteer for the zoo, how do they go about it since we're wrapping up now? Um, there, the website is the best place to get the, all the information. So if you go to lazoo.org and click on join our community and then click on volunteer, it will show you all the different volunteering opportunities available and an opportunity to apply online. So when you apply online, then you get all the information about upcoming information meetings and opportunities. Karen, it's great to talk to you. It's great to hear you. Uh, it's great information. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This is Tom Keish, and you've been listening to The Animal Agenda right here on KPFK, 90.7 FM in Los Angeles. We're streaming online <clears throat> every Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Our guest this week has been Kieran Doherty, Director of the Volunteer Program at Glaza. Special thanks to producer Marlena Bond and Melody King. If you have questions, suggestions, or want to know more, just write us at comments at kpfk.org. Or check out the Animal Agenda's Facebook page. Please support listener-sponsored KPFK by donating online at kpfk.org. We truly appreciate it.